Hi, this is Patrick Kilpatrick, and guess what? I'm on So Booking Cool with Jewel B, and I'm talking about my book, Dying for Living, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot. Keep reading. I'll talk to you soon. Welcome to So Booking Cool. It's Jewel B. Today's guest is an elite action villain whose career has spanned over 170 films and TV shows. He's the author of the well-received memoir, Dying for Living, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot, Volume 1, and Volume 2, Dying for Living, Wasted Talent in the Valley of Debacle, comes soon, I believe this summer. He is Patrick Kilpatrick. Patrick hello. Kilpatrick, hello. Thank you so much for talking to So Booking Cool today. Oh, my, and, I love your title of your, uh, your show. It's, it's a great know. one. Thank you so much. So is it true, like, we can expect Volume 2 this summer? Is yeah, that- you can. I'm. Uh, it's already written, um, I, and I'm just polishing it. You know, the experience of putting out Volume 1 and, uh, making sure that volume one packed all the punch that I thought people needed. So you just want to make sure you're not re- repeating something or, mm-hmm. and of course the moment in time moves along so rapidly in our culture that, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that we made that decision to divide it into two books though. And so, uh, yeah, I have some signing. I have a signing in Denver and a signing at the Telluride Film Festival. Uh, end of August. So, um, that's the, that's the plan. That's great. How do you feel about signings? Like, do you ever have any expectations for them? I try not to. I've, I've cultivated, uh, first of all, they, they vary wildly. Sometimes you have a big crowd and sometimes you have very few people come. Um, what I've done is, um, I try to do signings when I'm going someplace for something else. Uh, mm. like, um, like I'm going to Cartagena to get married, uh, in May. And so I'm doing a signing at the, the English, uh, speaking bookstore in Cartagena, which I thought was exotic. And, and I'm going fly fishing because I love fly fishing at the end of the summer. So hence Denver and the Telluride Film Festival and, Livingston, Montana, and places like that. So that way, I, I kind of connect them up with a vacation or a work trip for something else. Otherwise, it's not really, I mean, it's good for promotion and it's good for social media, but it's kind of a not a, a great economic model. Okay, that's that's very smart, and it also sounds like congratulations are in order, Mr. Kilpatrick. Oh, well, thank you very much. The book's doing really well. I'm really happy. It got a Best of L.A. award, and uh, it was just voted number nine of the 11 books any 30-year-old should read by a, 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 a book-buying site called Fopping, which I thought was a unique uh, – and we've gotten nothing but five-star – 100% five-star reviews, so I'm really on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, so – uh, people seem to like it, and journalists seem to like it. Yes, of course. Like, And that's so great to hear. I love that it's been getting wonderful feedback. How did you come up with the title for your memoir series? Well, the um, Dying for Living, uh, it, it means two things, really. One, since I had played so many villains, and often the villain meets his, as a uh, Lee Marvin said, whenever I come on the screen, you know I'm not going to get the girl and I'm going to get a cheap funeral. So um, I, uh, it refers to playing so many villains in so many action films. But it also refers to um, not only the people I respected when I was growing up, but the, how I tried to live my life, which was to really exuberantly gobble every second of every bit of your life that you could because even if you live to 114 we're not here that long so uh um it just worked um and the sins and confessions of a hollywood villain uh is sort of self-explanatory but um to a certain extent and 
and a, a liberty patriot. You know, we have a very unique political situation here in Hollywood, and so that was sort of calling that out. Hmm. How would you say it's unique? Well, Hollywood politics has been defined by um, – it's if you go back all the way to the 30s um, with the group theater, which emanated out of New York, and then, of course, the screenwriters – were really the playwrights who emanated out from New York. And, and that was a, a period in time which was very young. Young people were very enthused by the Soviet uh, revolution in Russia. Um, the excesses of Stalin had yet to come to, to surface. And um, so uh, Hollywood was filled with people that were uh, left-leaning and uh idealistic and compassionate and then that maintained itself um until about the Vietnam War and then of course the Vietnam War being so divisive you had huge segments of ho- Hollywood that were devoted to protesting against the war mm-hmm. uh they also were involved in the civil rights movement and, and that kind of thing so I think that energy um, has continued in Hollywood, um, and it it remains a force here. Um, Hollywood, of course, is very left. Um, I think sometimes it goes to the extreme. Um, Mm. I say in the book, uh, Hollywood never found a compassionate issue that they didn't take too far into lacking common sense, because uh, I think that's the case. I found myself somewhat at odds to the politics here, because as I articulate in the book, my father had been a World War II underwater demolition team and a hero of World War II, and had a Silver Star recipient and a Purple Heart recipient. And so when I got here, the vehement anti-military anti-American power energy um, and the sort of view of America as a great imperialist uh, oppressor uh, took me by shock and surprise because I'd grown up in Virginia and and Connecticut, which are very sort of revolution, uh, you know, American revolution kind of places. And, of course, there's the Confederacy and all this very historical background to all of that. So I was a little taken back when we got here, and particularly since we were involved in two wars. So uh, Hollywood is a very distinctive place, I think somewhat to Hollywood's detriment, because Mm -hmm. they've been so at odds to what I would call middle America that I think they've actually diminished their own influence. Uh, middle America cares less uh, about what Hollywood stars and Hollywood celebrities think now than maybe they might have done uh, during the civil rights movement. Um, so it's an evolving situation. Um, and I think it's so hyper-liberal that, um, and that liberalism uh, t- tends to be exclusionary. Um, if you want to destroy your career or alter it forever, all you have to do is not embrace one element of that that very rigid liberal orthodoxy. Um, so it's a it's a strange place. On the one hand, they gripe about the blacklist all the time, and on the other hand, they blacklist anybody who doesn't agree with them. So uh, there's a certain, I call, Hollywood is run by what I call gilded hypocrisy on a lot of levels. And much of it is good, and much of it is admirable. I think the, the gender diversity thing, the general diversity of the movement of Hollywood is a positive thing. Um, I think the vehement anti-American experiment aspect to it is a little troubling and problematic but uh these things have a way of balancing themselves out wow so so mr kilpatrick you were a writer before you became an actor um the kind of articles that you were doing what kind of articles were those were they in entertainment 
some of it was I, you know, I started out, I started out, and I was very lucky. I got early on, uh, I was hired to write advertising campaigns for magazines themselves. Like if Life Magazine was doing an ad campaign for Life Magazine, then I became an expert at doing that. And I did that for most of the magazines in New York. And that paid very, very well. Um, and that subsidized the journalism. So really a journalism, I did whatever I wanted because I would get to know the magazine by doing their advertising and then they'd buy a couple of articles from me. I did a lot of interviews, uh, Perry Ellis and Ted Turner and, um, uh, those kind of people for interview. And I did a lot of sports writing on rugby and, entertainment on dance and wine and food. It was really, I was very lucky because it was kind of whatever caught my fancy, I could write an article about and participate in it. Not so different from writing a screenplay and then starring in your own movie a bit, uh, particularly when you're talking about television journalism, uh, which I was doing for WOR. Um so I, I did a lot of things, whatever I thought would make a good story. Uh, uh, a motorcycle that goes 175 miles an hour at the time. Uh, I, I developed this way of, I would interview an inanimate object like Maud Frison's shoes. And so then I would get to do the answers and the questions. So uh, sort of having a little play with uh, question and answer format. What was the purpose then? Because that's really creative and clever of having of coming up like with the questions and the answers. Well, if you're asking a 175 mile an hour motorcycle uh, questions, then you, you you get to talk about um, speed and the nature of speed. And uh, speed is sort of cinematic, really. The faster you go, the more cinematic it becomes because it's blipping a lot. I mean, I can't even imagine what these guys who are doing NASCAR and Grand Prix driving because they're going 200 plus miles an hour all the time. That becomes their normality. But the, the point of it is you could, you could ask questions and then the answer, you could answer and you could get your, your notions of say in the case of Maude Frison, uh, your, your notions of style and, and, and uh, craftsmanship and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I'd have to put, it's been a while since I read those interviews, but, you know, with motorcycling, I was a motorcyclist myself, so I was interested in asking about the experience of speed and, and, um, and craftsmanship because it was a Ducati motorcycle and the difference between Italian motorcycles and American motorcycles and German motorcycles, English motorcycles. It basically, uh, whereas the straight interviews like Perry Ellis or Ted Turner or Gregory Hines or those kind of things, then uh, they, of course, are answering the questions. So you don't get to, to give the answer. So it was a, a little bit of a cheeky way to to get some information out about yourself and about the uh, experience of uh, whatever the activity or object was. Based on the interview, oh, were you going to add something else? Well, I was going to say, like, I, I did an interview of an organic wine. In those days, the organic was a very new concept. So the only wine that traveled from France at the time that was organic was a wine called Chateau Vin Loray. So when you interview Chateau Vin Loray, you get to talk about all the manufacturing and the culture of winemaking and all of that on both sides of the question and answer. What is your favorite thing about journalism? Well, I think the best thing about journalism is, is to reveal thugs and jerks um, and corrupt uh corrupt people who are doing evil. Um, unfortunately, I don't think journalism does a whole hell of a lot of doing that. Um, there are different kinds of journalism. I mean, you take Oriana Falacci. She was an Italian journalist. She was reared in the fascist, uh, non-fascist uh, environment of Italy. So she would go after 
people of power like Nixon or Henry Kissinger or uh, all, all the people that she interviewed. And she was a cheeky, uh, very brave woman. And so she would put them on the spot and, and cause them to have to reveal their inner workings of, of their exercise of power. So that's one kind of journalism. On another kind, you have, he's been now disgraced because of the Me Too movement, but he, Charlie Rose, who clearly was so curious about every aspect of the people that he interviewed. Uh, and that's an enthralling kind of journalism because you're finding out how other people live. You're walking in other people's shoes. Um, I think the paparazzi journalism is not of interest to me, but uh, the Washington Post, the Chicago Sun-Times, those investigative type things that actually go after polluters or um, banking scams and things like that, I think then journalism is a high calling. Celebrity journalism, not so much. When you have journalists who are, are dependent upon the movie studios for their junkets and their seeing films and things like that, then perhaps the journalism isn't, isn't as critical or as independent as it needs to, it needs to be. Oh, so the movie studios influence the questions in some cases, like what the journalist asks for the press junkets? Well, of course, and it's, look, it's, it's a matter of comfortability. Mm-hmm. If the celebrities who are in a movie, if you're going to be asking them telling questions that are potentially uncomfortable making, but very interesting journalistic questions, then you're not going to be included on the, the media junkets for very long. You know, mm. the, the, the point of the exercise becomes the sale of the movie, the elevation of the movie stars, not so much about getting to the truth. I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I, I interviewed Ted Turner. Mm-hmm. And Ted Turner was just opening CNN at the time. Dynamic guy. You know, you're talking about a force of nature. A great businessman, great media titan. And he had a reputation as a womanizer. And so I asked him, what would you do if your wife had a a reputation as a manhunter? And that almost ended the interview. And you ask questions like that too many times, and if you don't have a a journalistic vehicle, your magazine or your newspaper or the station backing you up, you're not long for the world because they want to they want to maintain a a pleasant relationship with the celebrity, the media titan, the businessman, whoever it is. So um, it takes guts to be a really good journalist, and you also have to have a a, a media uh, that will back you up. They have to be interested in, in investigative journalism. When do you think that you became good at journalism, Mr. Patrick? Well, um, I think if you're really inquisitive and you, you're intelligent and you can spot the holes in somebody's personality or the, the hypocrisy or the um, something that's convoluted about their personality, then you can ask very telling questions. You have to know your subject. That's in an, in an interview. Um, in, in the case of trailing something for a murder or a crime or something, you have to be very, very dogged. You have to be very, very inquisitive, and you have to be intelligent. And um, frankly, uh, I don't think it takes a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist to spot the truth on a lot of things. <laughs> Unfortunately, most people don't delve too deeply in our culture now, um, and they're getting everything in a very short form from the Internet and things like that. You have to be able to dive deep into it. It's the same skill set that's going to cause you to dive deep as an actor or as a writer. You have to bear down and go deep into whatever the topic is. 
you wanted to write a book at 32 years old, but you ended up writing a screenplay instead. At that point, did you still, even after writing the screenplay, did you still imagine that you would write a book? And was and was your memoir the book that you had in mind when you were in your early 30s? Actually, it was a play. The first thing that I wrote when it was a play after leaving advertising and journalism because I found myself at the Williamstown Theater Festival and I was running around with Blyde Theater and, and Richard Dreyfus and Christopher Rees and Frank Langella, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow when she was 12, you know, her parents were there. And so, and I was working as an assistant director, uh, with a man who became a huge Broadway force and a West End of London. Kennedy Center director, theater director named John Tillinger. So my first, which I think is great, uh, my first intro to to entertainment was theatrically. Um, and so instead of a novel, which I had left Time Incorporated to write, I ended up writing a play, and that play got uh, produced as part of the East Village uh, Arts Festival, and I was asked to join theater companies as a play selector, a thing we call the literary manager. And then I started acting, and that took off. Um, and it, after a couple of years uh, of writing plays for our own theater companies and things like that, what happened was I found myself moving to L.A. And L.A. is, although when I first got here, there was a lot of theater here, it's generally not a theater town. Um, it's a movie town, a television town. And so that energy got switched to script writing when I moved to L.A. Uh, did I think I was going to write a book about my life? No, but as you, Jewel, I, I've been an embedded journalist for 35 years now. And so I know the ins and outs of my aspects of the business, certainly the action business, the action television and film business, the um, I, I've gone head to head against everybody from Sean Connery to Tom Cruise to mm-hmm. Chow Young Fat and all these people. So I have very vivid uh, recollections of them and their graciousness or their flaws or whatever. And so there there had to be a place for me to to write that. Um, my acting career needed to slow down and produce in the directing, which is needed a gap uh, for me to write the book. And I, and I actually desperately wanted a gap because the movies take millions of dollars to raise and it's collaboration with lots and lots of people. And so it was a great delight to just write something just on my own again. And also it was a delight to write about something that had to do with my life when I'd been doing these scripts that were pretty far afield from my life. And how did you end up securing Boulevard Books as your publisher? Well, I got a recommendation to them from a, a writer, uh, writer slash private investigator named John Curley. And uh, I had a, I'm very grateful. Uh, the the book got picked up by a big time agent pretty quickly. Um, they basically said, "Well, this is a sounds like something people would like to read." And so, mm-hmm. I spent a good bit of time with an agent in New York, Murray Weiss at Catalyst uh, Literary Management. And I became the chief at the um, creative restrictions um what they do is they tell you you're the next hunter thompson or you're the next charles bukowski we'd love to represent you but then they start about changing everything that's in your book uh which is not an unusual phenomenon the same happens sometimes with movie scripts so uh, they love your work but they want to change every aspect of it so i really wasn't uh jiggy with that if you were <laughs> to use a slang so uh, I was put in touch with Boulevard Books, and I'd interviewed around at different places here in L.A. too. And uh, Boulevard was great. They just they took the book and wanted to – they didn't want to shave off what I thought was really valuable or witty or, or interesting about the book. And that's great because your vision 
you know, has obviously the feedback has been really great. So you trusted your instincts, right? Yes. You know, I think, I think we live in a time ever since Quentin Tarantino started that we're living in a time where audiences are pretty sophisticated. I mean, they actually can discern, uh, if the narrative goes a little left or a little right or goes up or down, uh, they, they enjoy, look, it's, it's storytelling. I felt I, I, I knew a fair amount about storytelling mm-hmm. after all that time in the magazines, all that time in the theater, all that time in the movies, all that time script writing. But, uh, New York publishing is extremely constrictive. And particularly, they don't, if you're, if you're a first time writer, and even, they don't care if you've written scripts, they don't care if you've written for every magazine in New York, you're a first time book uh, writer. And I really wasn't about to be treated that way. So, um, I've been very happy about it. I very much appreciate Murray Weiss, and, but I think it's, uh, you know, you also learn certain things about uh, New York publishing. Uh, New York publishing is about 70% liberal and about 30% conservative. And if if you don't think Trump is the antichrist, the liberals are not going to publish your book. And if you mention eroticism, the conservatives aren't going to publish your book. So here was a, a, a patriotic book that dealt with a lot of transgressive behavior. So, uh, again, it's an interesting phenomenon because they love you, but then they want to change everything. And uh, I just wasn't having it. So I was very happy to go with Boulevard Books. What do you want readers to get out of Volume 2 that they either did or you feel did not get in Volume 1? I think there's going to be more laughter in Volume 2 because it all has to do with show business. And a lot of it is just ridiculous. Um, and, you know, it's just really funny. Uh, and I think the, they'll be appalled by the inorganic brain damage of some leading people and, and uh, you know, the, the behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, the, uh, the first volume... Because I had somewhat of a unique upbringing with my father being so successful and my mother having her mental illness issues. There was a certain melancholy that embraced some of that too. But there was also an exuberance. I, I, I think there's going to be more exuberance in, in volume two. But, you know, this, it's going to be a, 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 a big book that covers a lot of Hollywood and the ins and outs of everybody and I try to be, I say I'm, I'm lovingly, ruthlessly candid. And, uh, um, I, I hope that it's, uh, you, you know, when you write a book, at least for me, or write a book like this, there are many legs that you want the book to stand on. Uh, volume one, the legs were, uh, politics, upbringing, how you ended up playing villains in movies, Laughter, exuberance of youth, uh, uh, insights into acting, how you craft all of that, um, and behind the scenes stuff. Well, there are legs for volume two that have to do with that. It covers the whole scope of all the jobs and all the players, and the producing and the directing and, and, uh, and, uh, a lot of offbeat events. You know, if you're an actor, you get invited to everything. It's really the perfect cover. If you were a terrorist, <laughs> oh, yeah. because you get into anywhere. Uh, I've been invited to the craziest stuff, you know, everything from the 25th anniversary of Forpita uh, to combat man tracking courses in Texas, you know, um, all of which is enthralling, and I'm very grateful for it. So uh, there's a lot more salaciousness in Volume 2. Although there's plenty of ribald carnality in volume one. So I, I, my, my highest thing is to emotionally drive people and also to make them laugh and be entertained. 
That was part one of my conversation with Mr. Patrick Kilpatrick. Stay tuned for part two, where we talk more about acting, stunts, Hollywood, his upcoming films, and more, only on So Booking Cool. Stay tuned.